Hi, I'm Barry Conrad, and this is Banter with BC. Cheers. Cheers. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Mm. And today I'm here with my guest, Philippe Bataan. Do you want to tell the people about yourself? Yeah, yeah, sure. My name's Philippe. I'm originally from New Zealand, born and raised in Auckland. Um, I moved to Australia in 2003, pursuing a career in dance, which was my previous career for quite some time. Mm -hmm. That led me into pursuing acting for a while, which is where we got to bond a lot. Mm -hmm. And that eventually led me to behind camera, um, directing and writing, which is my ultimate passion right now. Awesome. Yeah. And to kick things off, you like to start with something called two truths and a lie. Do you know how this works? I do. I've done my research. I think I got it. You're up. Yeah. Hit me. First one would be one of my first jobs in Australia was being a swim instructor. Okay. I have Scottish heritage, which would be a test of you because you know me really well. Yeah. Third one would be the first movie I ever went to see at the theaters mm. as a kid was Care Bears. I'm going to say the first one's a lie. You were in a swimmer. You were in a swimming teacher. I was. What do you mean? I was. Yeah. One of the first jobs I um, had when I came to Australia was a swim instructor. I, I saw it in the paper actually, and I applied for it. Pretty bad swimmer. I'm still a bad swimmer. That's what I was thinking. There's um, no way it could have been an instructor. Yeah. But uh, yeah, when I had the interview and told them what, about my dance background and being really good with kids, I grew yeah. up in a really big family. So I changed a lot of diapers growing up. So yeah, I've just always had a natural thing with kids. Um, and that was probably the thing why they employed me. But ladies, are you hearing this? Yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to throw away that. <laughs> Sounds like you just a dating show application there. Right? Okay, my turn. You ready? So as you know, I broke my right ankle in October. I actually broke my left ankle on my 10th birthday. On your 10th birthday. Okay. When I was a kid, I got stuck in a tunnel and developed claustrophobia. And I once arrived at a gig landing on a field in a chopper. Cool. All right. I think. Ricardo, do you want to come on the show? Come here. You have to come here. Yeah. Here. Okay, everyone, Definitely. come over here. This side, this side, this side. Right here. Yeah. So this is Ricardo, everyone. And he's just, what have you brought us here? What so is this? So a lamb like? shoulder, cooked sous vide and then roasted. We've got some silver beetroot, roasted carrots, and a uh, chicken juice. Looks delicious. Mm. It is delicious. Can't like wait to smell it. It's on the new Christmas Day menu, so get amongst it. It's gonna be amazing. <laughs> nice. I'm digging that one. Yeah, right? Yeah. I do believe the arriving to a gig in a helicopter. Why? I, because you gig a lot. So that you gig would a lot. I, I would definitely believe that. From a lot of conversations I remember, a lot of clients treat you really well um, at a lot of your gigs. So I could believe that actually happening. Even though I don't recall the conversation around that. You could have been drinking whiskey I was when I told you. I could have been, yeah. And I do also believe the claustrophobia story in the train for some reason. You are correct. Why did you not get the ankle? Is it not believable? I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I came and picked you up from this surgery. <laughs> And I, d I don't ever recollect you mentioning the other it one. happening before. So Should have thought this was stoked that I actually got that right. Because sometimes I really doubt my my listening skills. So, so you're uh, trying to say I'm a bad listener and you're good. No. <laughs> it's good that we established that. Great. Let's see. So which actor would play you in a movie about your life? Oh my gosh. Damn, which actor would play me? I'm trying to think of some New Zealand actors actually, you know? Okay. Yeah. That's good, oh, huh? So good. Yeah. I feel that too. I guess like one of the New Zealand actors that I, I do admire that I learned about through you, that I've connected with his work and stuff, is Manu. I think he's a great actor. Mm -hmm. I loved him on Spartacus. I loved his character on Spartacus. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that character in particular about him being, having such a strong front, being a gladiator, but you know, his love interest in that story. Yeah. Um, it's kind of exposing his softer side, yeah. which I feel like I relate to, you know, I, I feel like I always kind of get portrayed as someone who's maybe a little bit standoffish and who can come across a bit tough you think at so? times because, well, because I, I'm not always the most like talkative person. Um, so I think sometimes that gets kind of portrayed as a little bit hmm. um, egotistical or whatever which I'm not at all, by the way. But yeah, you know, I, I definitely feel like underneath layers that a lot of people don't know, I'm, I'm really just a big softy and quite an emotional person. 
I can, um, I can attest to that. So yeah, yeah. I think money would be uh, would be awesome to, to play me at some degree. Shout out to bro, money have been it. Good bro. What's the biggest stereotype surrounding what you do? Interesting. Thought bubbles. Yeah, definite thought bubbles right now. I think a stereotype yeah. most people have about directors is they're usually, the aesthetic is usually like big, fat, and really educated. Wow. <laughs> and I'm like the opposite of all of those. Don't you like embody all those things? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like maybe after this meal. That's funny. That's an interesting question. Definitely thought bubbles on this capture. Thought bubbles. Yeah, just, just, I haven't had this, this kind of question before. So I guess what's per what has been personal to me, Yeah. I guess getting into directing and coming from a background of dance, I feel I did kind of enter the space of trying to direct film where I was kind of stereotyped as being a dancer, not a filmmaker yeah. or a storyteller. And yeah, I guess that was kind of hard to deal with, right? Because then you sort of tend to shoulder yourself with this expectation to sort of prove your abilities yeah. to other people, and which can then hinder your own progress, you know, and I guess like manifest self-doubt and stuff like that, which which is huge, um, you know, and, and I guess being a filmmaker, you. You need that confidence and people on the other side of the camera and the rest of the crew and everything sort of rely on that confidence from you yeah to know what you're doing so that was probably one thing that i did encounter very early was people who knew me as being a dancer yeah um wanting to pursue um filmmaking without sort of like relinquishing any abilities that i actually maybe had to tell stories and you know i was able to i guess early on i was able to lean into the fact of having pursued acting for a while so i mm. i knew how to work with actors and i knew how to get what i wanted out of them but yeah you know i didn't go to film school or anything like that so I would focus so much attention on the actors and then very little attention on kind of anyone else. Yeah. You know, forgetting that I also had a cameraman sometimes and things like that. So yeah. that exposed a lot. But yeah, I think it was the transition of, of going from being a dancer um, to someone behind the camera and, and, and without, yeah, I guess being boxed into one particular art form. I get that. Yeah. People having an expectation of you or trying to label you, are oh, you're just... Mm just a dancer or you just belong here you kind of come here where's the resume or what have you done or like what makes you a director i get i get all that stuff mm. it's interesting yeah how's that happened for you where to turn it on me mm. <laughs> no it's, it's true like especially if you rewind back to x factor days i did that show another lifetime coming from reality tv into acting was, it was really hard to shake the stigma of, oh, you're just a reality TV contestant, you're not really a real actor. And so to do that, to shake that, we intentionally went to theater first mm. because, and into like a really stripped back intimate show, which you saw, Violet, and there's nowhere to hide, there's no lights, there's no set. And that helped to break down maybe perceptions, but it was a slog, like you gotta, people like to box things to make sense of it. Mm, you know, absolutely. and I think, a lot of human nature can be like that so you have to sort of prove yourself and earn your stripes in a way but it can be frustrating because unless you spell it out for people they don't often understand or get it or mm. if the, the general public sees it or if the majority sees it then they come to the party mm. but making their own mind up oftentimes they won't do it it's like oh i don't understand that you know so yeah you know, that's interesting. do you find that perspective where people will kind of tend to box you in is something that is kind of just resonates everywhere or do you find that it's something that is a little bit unique to us to australia the australian entertainment industry i definitely think good question i think that a lot of the mentality or energy or approach in america is collaborative people celebrate ambition wanting to get ahead let's get together let's do this and everything happens so quickly yep at the speed of relationship over here it's different in the sense of i feel at times when i'm myself that seems extra to people whereas when i'm who i am now in america it's, it's normal it's like mm. celebrated mm. it's great so and that's not a chip on my shoulder it's like different cultures different whatever but yeah i absolutely think that it, it is quite uh, prominent in Australia where if you do well like let's chop you down so you don't get too proud or this is this tall poppy thing and I think mm -hmm. it's unnecessary because you can ascend and progress that doesn't mean that that's a bad thing it doesn't mean that you're arrogant or it's a negative thing I think I don't know what it is societal construct or stay humble just stay in the trenches I agree with 
all of that, I definitely feel like there is a bit of tall poppy syndrome kind of here in Australia where, like you say, you know, people feel sort of the need to keep people in check. But for um, no apparent reason, really. Yeah. 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 But like you say, it's, you know, it's different of culture and yeah. everything like that. So I love Australia, by the way. It's a great country. I think it's right. It's my home. Yeah, exactly. So. And like speak, speaking about dance, you just mentioned before. So you were a top four finalist and so you think you can dance Australia. You dance for people like Beyonce, Kylie Minogue, Jason Derulo, Rita Ora. The list goes on. So what about that chapter of your life or that season of your life? How has that helped shape you now? Shape who you are? Yeah, look. I think dance is a really tough industry no matter where you're doing it. I think we are fortunate south of the hemisphere to have the opportunities that we have to to make it a career and, and a thing that we can do on a day-to-day -day basis and make a living mm. from it. But yeah, I, I think like relative to any art form, you know, I, th I think just being in the arts, you there's there's a slog that you have for decades. Yeah. You know, which like non-artists most can just not comprehend yeah you know you are slaving away for minimal money really ultimately just to express yourself and and yeah, yeah. It, it's like the longest it's the longest yellow brick road ever that just doesn't ever seem to end but you know i believe that builds like a lot of tenacity and hardness to artists when okay. they have the ability to push aside a lot of lifestyles that can be sort of projected onto us, you know, in terms of like going to get a safe job and having a good career. And it's like, yeah, but you know, we just want to do what we love doing, you mm -hmm. know? We just want to express ourselves in these ways, whether it's dance or acting or storytelling or, or singing or anything. Um, you know, we can't help but want to, to pursue and, and chase that thing. Um, yeah and yeah it just it comes with such a unique set of obstacles that uh, yeah i just believe sh you know if you do stick it out for um you know which we obviously have been doing two going on three decades now ourselves you know what time means no. <laughs> this is really good lamb <laughs> not trying to show it's angry, great lamb. great lamb it's really delicious uh, my pursuit of dance for 10 years before I got into it professionally and really helped shape my approach moving into filmmaking because my pursuit mm. of dance, like it was just, a, it was a struggle, you know, I, financially, it was such a struggle and, and doing so many jobs that I hated being at all so that I could really express myself because dance was the only way mm. that allowed me to, to really do it within my own comfort zone. Yeah. So yeah, I just, I just, feel that dance kind of like gave me a lot of the tenacity um, and the experience to then sort of once I came across filmmaking sort of you know have the ability to sit back and be okay I learned from having that dance career mm -hmm. now yeah I know it's not a path that I want to duplicate the exact same way yeah um, I know the journey is hard so you know what can I take from that pursuit of dance mm -hmm. that I can apply into film in terms of the way I try to pursue that career. So that's kind of opened my mind into, you know, having a side hustle and, and doing mm. other things mm. um, that can financially support myself because film's super expensive as well. To, yeah, to me. Sort of until you're established. So yeah, but yeah, I, I believe that just the dance pursuit just built so much drive and tenacity in me that, yeah, once my mind is kind of fixed on something, like I mm. don't know how to give up. So good. Yeah, it's awesome. And so you're working on a project right now called Delicate. Tell us about that and how, what inspired that? Yeah, so Delicate is a feature film screenplay that mm -hmm. I've written. Um, yeah, that's been in the works for a little while now. So I guess it's, you could say it's still in development. The story is set in New Zealand, back home in Aotearoa. It's a story about a young Māori woman uh, who faces the shadows of her mother's suicide. Um, and her abusive stepfather, all while she's trying to chase a coveted position in uh, New Zealand's like most prestigious dance company. Wow. Yeah, it's, I originally wrote it as a drama. Um, it kind of evolved into a psychological thriller, actually. Okay. Uh, not a heavy one. Uh, there are some tones of, um, I guess, other films for reference. Uh, like Black Swan um, okay. and Whiplash. Um, so they're films that 
you know, do touch on sort of the psyche between pasta and good cheese. Yeah. They, yeah, they touch on the psyche oh, yeah. between the, you know, the sort of student teacher relationship. Yeah. What's your weirdest habit? Oh my God. <laughs> that right of the weirdest. Right weirdest habits. I feel like I might need to hear yours first. No. To like inspire me. No. Just why tell us. Well, why don't you tell us what your weird? Oh, here we what? go. Yeah, weird. I don't Super. know if they're all that weird, to be honest. I don't know if I really have discovered this weird stuff. Really? Um, I mean, I, I know he's just like the junk food master. You know, loves his like potato chips. Why are you going to put me on blast like chips Come on, man. chocolate and stuff? This guy can pack it away. So when it's like junk food night, which is, uh, I'm assuming, uh, quite a few nights of the week, sometimes it's like multiple packets of chips. It's like, a big bar of chocolate. So it was like maybe two Sundays ago or something. Like yeah. came over. Why are you trying to put me out? Like, come on, the people don't need to see that. I bought some food. <laughs> bought some. Bought one big whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. One ch of chocolate. It was gone before I even like was looking at it. My people ankle needed it. Gone. My broken ankle yeah. needed the chocolate to recover. So I definitely know that he can pack that away. It's not that's really weird sure. though. Is it? Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I don't know if I know your weird stuff. So what's your weird? You mm. dodging the question. I mean, I do, ever since I was a kid, I have to sleep with a uh, blow between my legs. No? Really? Yeah. See, so okay, so that must be weird because of the That's kind of weird. you just gave me. Like what, between you, so you're sleeping and you just have it there, why would you yeah. do that? I don't know, it's just a comfort thing. I don't you're know if that's what I just <laughs> used to do as a kid. Yeah, it's just, just what's, it's, feel, it's like feeling something between my legs. When it rests there, it just gives me comfort. I don't know. I don't, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut, cut this out because it sounds like you're basically trying to <laughs> say, well, I want to feel like I have something. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's it's just, if I just put a pillow there, <laughs> then I feel like I can go to sleep. But I don't know. It's part of, even even if I'm on a plane, I, I, can't, I can't go to sleep if I'm vertical. I've got to be horizontal. But if I'm vertical and sitting up, because the, you know, the plane seats are so yeah. small. If I just put a pillow between my legs and I just let it rest there, somehow it slowly will make me start to doze off. It's pretty funny. I don't know. That's maybe just, just a maternal thing. That's great. Being a kid. There I'm you go. Sure. You heard it here first. Yeah. There you go. That was good. He was cr mm. cracking up behind the camera. Because <laughs> yeah. it sounded like you're saying- thinking you're dirty, that's why. Yeah. So I got, a, I got a question for you, if that's okay. Oh, okay. It's not like oh. a- Go ahead. not anything intense. Okay, go ahead. No, just because I know you can deliver. Oh, here we go. Because I don't know if anyone's asked you this. Maybe oh, here we go. Series. So on your next question, to me, can you maybe sing it? Sing the question to you. Sing the question, however you like. Okay, this is fun, this is interesting. I just thought it's never warmed up today. I don't know. What do I sound like, Wes? What? What's been your biggest rejection in life? <laughs> Damn, biggest rejection in life. Oh my gosh. I think I still go through them, to be honest. And it's probably gotten harder as I've gotten older. I think like maybe dating life. Okay. Yeah, I think right. dating life, when you when, when the whole rejection around dating life, you know, when you become emotionally invested in someone. Yeah. And you kind of, I guess, get rejected from that. You know, you don't take, take love in your pursuit of like wanting connection and everything when yeah. you're a lot younger. But now I'm mid forties, you know, it is something that I do try to um, put more energy into. So I think that, yeah, I, I think that's probably still one of my struggles because s something like that can still yeah. trigger things inside of me that I didn't even know was there that Likewise. forces me to self-reflect. Like, well, I guess I, you know, I've kind of had a couple of experiences over the last two to three years that I've been living back in um, Sydney now. Yeah. And I remember one dating experience did come up around attachment theory. Oh wow, this, you're getting real, here we go. Yeah, why not, right? <clears throat> Must be the beef root, I'm not sure. Yeah, and anyway, so I was getting to know um, this really beautiful girl and liked everything about her, started investing myself emotionally, which doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and we kind of got, we got to a point where we sort of like talked about what we wanted, ended up not being mutual. Yeah. I wanted to pursue things further. Um, she didn't, which was fine. But immediately after that, like a lot of the contacts started dying. Yeah. You know, which was okay at the time. 
like um, ghost sent potential like not not a, no it was just uh, i mean maybe i'm not you know i i guess i don't have those answers yet um but it was kind of like the radio silence then sort of triggered stuff in me mm -hmm. You know, because it was then I would sort of go into sort of self reflect and being, am I not good enough? Like, I thought we had a thing. What is it about me? And yeah, it used to be like thoughts around this person would sort of be like the last and first thing that I would go to sleep with and wake up with. Wow. And naturally that gave me anxiety. And that's probably one of the only areas in my life where actually developing anxiety as around sort of acceptance by females. After probably about two weeks of that continuously, I sort of delved into trying to find out why I get triggered by that because it wasn't the only time it's happened. It's happened in other previous stadium experiences. Right. And yeah, so I came across uh, attachment theory and sort of when I dived into what those different theories were, that exposed kind of this, uh, I guess, some questions around my connection with my mother, which has been a long mm. developing relationship mm -hmm. um, since, since, yeah, sort of 2015 and reconnecting with her. So it kind of triggered some questions there in terms of exactly what my childhood was like, mm. sort of, you know, in my first like 24 months. I learned some masters around that that I completely wasn't ready for, but explained so much about why I get triggered when I get rejected right. and and when I um, yeah have moments of going through my want of um, giving emotion and, and giving love to someone not being reciprocated. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one that, that goes through that. Thanks for sharing that, I was very brave. What cheers you up on a bad day? I like my junk food as well. So junk yeah, food. you know, being a Kiwi, <laughs> potato chips, the old meat pie. I've always had a thing for sugary drinks, nothing too crazy, but just some sodas or juice or something like that, I always tend to gravitate to. Gravitate to. Mm. So you're basically telling people to emotionally, is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> is that what you're yeah, it's promoting? not a good reference. <laughs> Definitely don't recommend anyone following my path. As a kid, I grew up as a real loner, massively. Um, I, w I always had a busy household. Yeah. Always a lot of people there. Yeah. But yeah, I think it was just always something that was maybe even within my own dynamic of my family as yeah. a kid I had developed a lot of, I guess, social anxiety around. Um, so when the lounge would get too busy, like I would go off to my room or one of the rooms that wasn't being occupied and finding some sort of way to escape from all that. Sometimes that was coloring in books with yeah. Disney. Yeah. That was the thing I used to love doing as a kid. Or just watching film, you know, that's been my biggest form of escapism since I was a kid. And, yeah. and why I'm so stoked that I kind of gravitated back to that as an adult now. But yeah, I, I, I'm not too sure what sort of lies underneath all of that yet. Why I, I keep wanting to sort of distance myself from people sometimes. I think that's maybe still some of my own when you have a self-sabotaging yeah. mechanisms yeah when i have a bad day sometimes yeah I just absolutely just want to be alone and and just do those little things that give me comfort which usually is just sitting to a movie and eating some junk food swap the flies away swatting flies away yeah. chasing birds away like um, wes is doing <laughs> if, you, if you guys could see what i can see <laughs> like while philippe was talking to before wes is walking over Shooting birds away, it's pretty funny. <laughs> what what gets you through a tough day? When I had this ankle situation, like, as you know, my number one form of self-care is the gym and working out and training. And I couldn't do that. And I didn't realize how much I relied on that to set my day up and my mind up mm. every day. And I was told to basically elevate my leg for 23 hours a day for the first two weeks. So I'm sitting in my bed and I can't do anything. So mentally I had to go, what else can I do to pick myself up and that was quite challenging so in the best of days I can go to the gym feel chirpy feel good feel ready for the day get after it and the worst of days I had to actually learn patience with myself be kind with myself that I was slow and that things weren't getting done at my pace so it's, it's been a learning thing but to answer your question specifically exercise it's my number one thing exercise get moving fill my my ears and my eyes with things other than social media, first thing. So that could be good music, a podcast or something like that, because that sets me up and that makes me feel really good. And if I just have a really bad, a fight with someone or something goes south with a deal or something like that, yeah, I'll watch a movie and 
have some trinkets mm. trinkets aka chips chocolate you know yep you know the, the spicy cheetos the flame and hot cheetos is where it's like <laughs> yeah. please, please sponsor me first one that comes to your mind your go-to meal your go-to song choice and your go-to podcast is this bands with these yeah yeah, yeah. yeah i mean we got to get to know about you too <laughs> off the top of my head if i'm making it my go-to meal would actually be like a big fat steak with sauteed potatoes and lots of butter so i'll make that and then like have wine i'm not gonna say like a whole bottle of wine but like a little wine or like some whiskey and then I'll have some Whitaker's chocolate with flaming Hot Cheetos as a trinket. For that, for a podcast, I'll do 10% Happy with Dan Harris or some Jay Shetty. Literally the last song I listened to was a Craig David song, I was showing Keenan. It's more like, oh, oh Labyrinth. I'll listen to some Labyrinth because he's chill. Mm. Emotive, but not too down. Yeah, just listen to that. It's chill, good music. Was there a specific turning point or moment that drew you to film from dance? Yeah, it was definitely an event. So in 2013, I moved to China. I was at contract there. I did a TV commercial as a dancer and all the film crew were a bunch of bodies. I did connect with one of the guys there um, who was from Brisbane and yeah. I, I had spent, I think almost eight years living in Brisbane yeah. when I first moved over. Yeah. So we, we had that instant rapport. Anyway, we had a production company with a few friends. What's some noisy ass birds, y'all. Birds. Definitely fly away. Yo, know, jump in on my thing. I know. Yeah. Louise is trying to shoot them away. Oh, Louise is like. That was kind of coming out of my dance career, um, sort of, and slash my pursuit of acting when I. Wanted, I still wanted to pursue acting when I moved overseas, but mm. in China as a foreigner, it's really hard to pursue acting unless you can speak fluent Mandarin in terms yeah. of the ro types of roles you can go for, which I didn't do either. So I naturally gravitated into writing, trying to write screenplays. So I wrote some short films and yeah, over the period of getting to know this production crew, I jumped in and I basically just like shit kicked with them for about a year. Mm made coffees and yeah. went to set and just carried things around um, just so I could sort of stay active and I guess learn more about the entire production hmm. process. Yeah, and then once I got in really good with the owner, then um, yeah, they were just like, you know, if you ever got anything that you want to shoot or whatever, like let us know. Yeah, and I did have one story that was, I felt was kind of good to go. And that's that was the first short film that I ever made. It was, it was pretty horrible, it was pretty terrible. In terms of story, it looked awesome, but yeah, there was just no story to it. Yeah. And, and that was my first opportunity to make something. And that was just a one night shoot. I paid for everything of it, which my God, definitely was a big lesson. Yeah. In terms of how much making film costs. Yeah. And yeah, once we actually got into post production for that, that was my trigger point. I felt completely out of depth. I felt like I had no idea what I was doing. Mm. But for some reason, everything just felt right. So yeah, that it was just basically from that experience of, of just trying to make a, a film or make a short film. Yeah. That yeah, you know, kind of exposed all of these things that I'd been wanting to feel with dance for quite a long time. I kind of felt with dance like I was sort of limited to how I was able to express myself after a while. Yeah. I was okay at you know what I tried to pursue, which is around like sort of the hip hop. Job. Genre, but I just felt like the, the expression of physical movement limited how I wanted to tell the world yeah. who I am and yeah. things like that. But yeah, but with film, you know, there's it tests so much um, your understanding of the human psyche, um, history, um, everything about color, costume, timelines, the story, uh, you know, story structure itself. And yeah, that, that first project, yeah, I just felt like I was just in the deep end with floaties that were just going mm. south really quickly. <laughs> but I, I, I loved it. I think it was just that element of feeling really out of my depths. It was an Instagram post that I saw the other day uh, that just said like, uh, sometimes opportunity whispers, it doesn't knock. Mm -hmm. And I think it was that, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think this thing of always loving film, having it as my escapism and sort of somehow following me yeah. through all of these years that eventually just kind of like whispered behind me, behind my ear that, yeah, eventually I listened to and fortunately I'm now blessed to have the want to pursue that anyway. I'm so good. I'm still, it's, it's still so far to go. What's a life challenge that you're really proud of conquering? I feel like my biggest life challenge that I'm most proud of was 
dealing with my childhood traumas. I think the majority of people don't ever find the courage to do that, let alone if they even discover what those are. Yeah. And I think that's probably impacted my life the most as a storyteller, as a person. Changed dynamics on a lot of my friendships and, mm. and my relationships within my family as well, ourselves included. So yeah, you know, and that can be like a really hell of a dark place to go to sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I get it that a lot of people sometimes don't want to deal with those traumas mm -hmm. but yeah coming out the other side i don't know what life would be like if had i you know some of the catalyst moments not happened yeah. in my life to sort of force me to deal with my own shit basically last question what's your favorite christmas song favorite this is our christmas, christmas, this is our christmas episode so what is your favorite christmas damn song? i don't know if i know the titles of all of them mate i mean i know i always listen to michael buble on christmas yep just something about that soothing voice man just like settles you and I, f I feel like, yeah, okay, it's Christmas mode now. Nice. Mario Carey makes me want to get up and party. Yeah. For a Christmas version. So yeah, I kind of prefer Bublé's. I guess any of the Christmas songs by him. Michael Bublé, what about you, Is? What's your favorite Christmas song or Christmas album? I would say like, Fati. Fati. Yeah, it's pretty okay. good. Yeah. And to finish things off, I'm going to hit you with some fast trivia. You ready? Question number one, which director always carries a flask of hot tea on set. My God, I don't know. It's someone that you like. Take a guess. That I like as a director? Hot flask or tea? God, I really don't know. Should I just take a stab in the Take dark? a stab. And I, Ron Howard? Christopher Nolan. Nolan, okay. Which female actor and artist used to work as a backup dancer for Janet Jackson? Wait, I know she was Come on, engaged bro. to Channing. I remember the concert now and when they all come out and introduce themselves. Is it Jenna the one? J Lo. Oh my God, sorry, as a question, <laughs> married to who? No, I said, which female actor and artist used to work as a backup, backup dancer, dancer for Janet Jackson? Uh, okay. See, because there's more than one. So I got that. Anyway, okay. thumbs great. The three types of directing approaches are called? Directing approaches. Oh. There's, there's three, there's three types. Oh gosh. Mine, yours, and everyone else's? <laughs> yeah. The um, auto approach, the collaborative approach, and the interpretive approach. Hmm. There you go. Interesting. There you go. Which city did the Foxtrot dance originate? Yeah. Done Foxtrot once. Happy to not know. I'm really amazing at these questions, aren't I? Really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> take a guess. Take a guess. Yeah. All my evidence is in my work. Foxtrot. Yeah. I'd be like, Tokyo, Jamaica. I don't know. Somewhere in Europe? New York. In New York. So you got one yeah, in the four? One in the four there? How'd you feel about that? Good? Pretty, um, pretty good, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Philippe, thanks so much for coming on the Christmas episode of Banter with DC. Really good. appreciate it. Thank you. Merry Christmas to everyone watching this episode. I hope you have an amazing, safe, blessed, fun, festive Christmas and New Year's. Merry Christmas. If you love this episode of Banter with BC, don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you next time.